Well, uh, welcome everybody to the English Catholic History Association uh, online Zoom uh, talk this evening with Dr. Mark Sherwood. Uh, very welcome to everybody. Uh, if you have any questions or anything you'd like to say, you can put it into the chat box uh, and uh, you'll find that somewhere on your screen if you click on that and open that. Uh, I don't know whether you'd like to say where you're from, where, which countries you're from. I know the last talk we had, we had people from uh, Mexico, North America, Spain, I think Poland too as, as well actually. So you might be very international, I don't know. So uh, anyway, very welcome to everybody and uh, I'll tell you a little bit about uh, Dr. Sherwood, if I may. So uh, he's a modern historian look, looking at issues uh, of identity, loyalty and religion in the late 17th century. He submitted his thesis on Catholic other in the army of uh, James II and William III, 1685 to 1690 in late June, 2022. Successfully defended his thesis at the Viva in September, 2022. Completed his MA and PhD at the University of Leeds and taught at the University of Leeds and York. And currently, he's currently a visiting research fellow at University of Leeds and uh, he married with children as well. So some interesting things there. So uh, we'll uh, shortly hear what he's got to say. So the title of the talk is on the on the slides there. Over to you, Mark. Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, so today I'd like to talk about, uh, so the title of uh, the talk is Service Consistent with the Interest of the Kingdom, which is something that will come up later during the talk. Uh, and it's looking at Catholic troops in the service of both James II and uh, William III. Now, I guess there's a couple of sort of caveats that I'd like to put at the start. Uh, the first one is, due to records in this period, most of the information that we have is about officers rather than about common soldiers. Uh, but where possible, I have identified common soldiers as well, and I will be talking about uh, them. Uh, the other thing is to save constant repetition, I'm just going to be using the short title of Kings. So uh, James II, rather than his full title of James II and James VII, and uh, William, rather than either William Prince of Orange or William III. Uh, the other thing is, for some ease, although I'm not totally happy with the term, I will use, uh, when describing the events of 1688, I'll use the common term that everybody tends to talk about, which is the Glorious Revolution, although there are a number of issues with calling it that. Uh, but that's just some of the basic caveats. So the reason that I started my research is there's a couple of I've always been bothered with a couple of sort of the generalities that people had assumed of both uh, James II's role and to a certain extent, William's army. And these were the fact that James promoted Catholic officers over Protestant officers, and he intended on creating a Catholic army uh, out of the English army. Uh, and there's a, in all the history books when I started reading about this is spent 96 Catholic officers from taking the test in 1685. Uh, other ones was James II imported Catholic officers to fill the officer class in England. Uh, a general one, James was responsible for commissioning all the uh, officers in the English army. And the last one was that William III's army was an ultra Protestant army and it was uh, filled purely with Protestants. Uh, and these always bothered me and they bothered me for a long time. And when I started doing my PhD thesis, I started looking at each of these ones in turn. Now, the other thing I titled my thesis and hopefully when I get around to writing the book, it will be in there somewhere as well, is I talk about the Catholic other. And the reason that I use the term the Catholic other is because in a lot of cases, people's uh, religious identity 
has never been proven. There's a lot of people that we know that were Catholic. There's a lot of people that we know that were definitely Protestant, but there's a large group of people in the middle that get assumed to be one, either Catholic or Protestant. And quite often this was down to their loyalty. And there was a general loyal uh, perception that was put in place, certainly in the late 16, sort of 87, 88, and sort of at the start of the reign of William and Mary, that if you supported William, that you were a Protestant, and if you supported James II, you had to be by default being a Catholic. And obviously when we come to the war in Ireland and the later Jacobite rebellions, this sort of adds to this ongoing propaganda. And one of the people that I came across is an interesting gentleman by the name of Ambrose Cave, who was commissioned a lieutenant in the fourth troop of horse guards. Now, this troop, is, if you read all the historiography, was always assumed to be made up purely of Catholic officers. It was brought into being by James II, uh, and it was meant to just have Catholic, sort of everybody in the troop uh, being Catholic. And so Ambrose Cave was meant to have been Catholic. Uh, to fit with that, it doesn't particularly help the fact that a lot of his family were Catholic. And indeed in his family home, there was known to be a, by this time, uh, a secret Catholic chapel. But in actual fact, he was Protestant. He always was Protestant. Uh, he was asked to convert on a number of occasions and never did. So this is where I get the term, if you like, sort of the Catholic other, those people that are assumed to be Catholic because they supported James. Uh, and we'll come slightly further back to the uh, fourth troop of horse guards later on in the talk. So Catholic versus non-conformist or the Catholic other. Now, going back to one of those initial questions that I started to raise about these 96 officers that were dispensed from taking the test. So the Test Act, as I presume people know, but I will just go through it very briefly, was an act that was passed effectively to make sure that only Protestants could hold positions of power within uh, government, effectively what we now class as local government, or the army. So you had to attend Church of England services regularly, and if you didn't attend church, a list would be put forward, would go through to effectively the bishop, and you would get fined. You had to deny transubstantiation, and you had to swear an oath that effectively the king was the highest power. Now, this was something that fell short of James II because after he, uh, before he took the crown and when he openly converted to Catholicism, at that time he was Admiral of the Navy and he was forced to resign from his position there because, in theory, he, well, because he couldn't take hold of the test. Now, the dispensations that come up. Uh, when I started looking at the original wording, it just says, warrant to the Cherney General to prepare a bill to pass the Great Seal after reciting that being well assured of the loyalty and fidelity of, in please insert name here, for dispensing the person named for taking the oath of allegiance and supremacy, etc., required by the various acts of parliament. Now, the problem that we had with his that I looked at here is although the Catholic population in England around this time was probably about 2% of the population. The non-conformist population was, is probably about another 10% of the English population. And anybody that was a non-conformist also fails the test. Because although they don't fit the second two parts, which is transubstantiation and swearing that the king is the highest power, because that was aimed purely at Catholics, because obviously as a Catholic, the Pope is the highest power on earth, they still don't attend a Catholic, uh, Church of England service. So people had assumed that because officers were dispensed from taking the test, they were in actual fact Catholic, where they were also quite often would be Protestant or Protestant non-conformist. 
Now, there are a couple of caveats to the Test Act. Uh, you had to take it within three months of taking your uh, position. If you were on service overseas, it didn't apply. So any of the uh, soldiers or officers that were serving in overseas territories, including Tangiers, which had been gifted to England as part of the dowry of uh, Catherine of Braganza when she was married to Charles II, the Test Act didn't apply. And in actual fact, the garrison in Tangiers uh, held large numbers of Catholic, both soldiers and officers. There was a Catholic chapel in Tangiers and there was a chaplain who looked after all their needs. And when we handed that garrison or Tangiers back in uh, 1684, because it was costing the crown a huge amount of money, which incidentally is the reason why Portugal actually sort of gave it as part of the dowry, because it was costing them too much money. All those soldiers were just incorporated back into the English army at the time. And one of the things that here I guess I'd like to talk about is this idea of loyalty. And as I sort of said earlier, there is certainly there's a big inter. Actual fact, loyalty is a far more nuanced than that and also multi-layered. And there's some of the examples that I'll go through later on that will sort of highlight these points about this multi-layered loyalty that we get. One of them is a gentleman by the name of Colonel Thomas Bellingham. Uh, and in December of 1688, uh, there were rumours that were spreading, effectively, that uh, James II had died. And although Bellingham was a loyal supporter of William, so much so that he'd raised a regiment on behalf of William and was one of the first Protestant officers to raise a regiment when William landed in England, he was so distraught about the fact that he thought James II had been had died, is he sent a letter and was saying, and the quote here is, we had a report of the king's death, but God be praised, it proved false. So even though that he was supporting William in his uh, attempt to usurp the crown, he still was held some loyalty actually to the king and was glad to see the fact that the king in actual fact was still alive. Could ever have been a Catholic army in England. And one of the concerns that people had at this time is during 1685 and 1686, the Irish army, which is by default, although a separate institution, still sort of under the overall control of the king, goes through a period of purging, or is meant to purge, all of their Protestants out of the army and replace them with Catholics. Now, Ireland is obviously a very different country. It's made up of the majority of Catholics within the country. And one of the things that the army was, certainly the officer class of the army in England was concerned about, is when you were an officer in this period, you paid for your commission. And commissions were worth quite a lot of money. Uh, and when you got promoted or when you uh, retired, you would sell your commission and you'd get the money back from it. Now, because of so many Protestant officers in Ireland lost their commissions, there wasn't the wealth in the Catholic community in Ireland to pay the market value. So a lot of officers complained that they lost money. And this was such a lucrative industry of officer commissions that people, uh, wealthy people would effectively loan money 
to, to officers at the start of the career to help them buy their commissions based on the fact that when they sell them later that they can get a return back. And this worried sort of the upper class in England that they thought if James did the same that people would lose their money. But if we look at the number of Catholic officers that James commissions, and these are people that are either proved to be Catholic or assumed to be Catholic, you can actually see that the number of officers that he commissions is very, very small compared with the total number. So in 1685, the army gr grows massively. When James comes into power, there's less than 9,000 soldiers in the English army. As you may be aware, in July 1685, only sort of four months after he comes to power, the Duke of Monmouth tries to launch a rebellion, forcing James to increase the size of his army. Most of the officers that he commissions or issues commissions to are Protestant. They're not Catholic. And this carries on. 1686 is the only year where you get a, a higher percentage of Catholic officers. Now, a lot of these commissions that we see are only short term. So a lot of the ones in 1685, regiments are raised or commissions are issued for regiments. But because the rebellion lasts so short a period of time, a lot of these regiments don't ever actually get commissioned because there's no need for them. But James does increase the size of the standing army. Now, we're looking that overall, out of some 4,000 commissions that I've identified, there's only 380 or 379 that are English officers, that are Catholic or presumed to be Catholic that James commissions. So that's just under sort of 10% of the entire officer corps. And these aren't an action of somebody that is deliberately trying to turn an English army into a Catholic army. It's somebody that's effectively just commissioning officers. Now, one of the other things that I looked at is this idea that James II was commissioning every officer. And for some reason, this idea has sort of developed credence since 1688 and has stayed in sort of the written text all the way through when in reality, the idea that James would know 4,000 people and we're not just talking about colonels who are raising regiments here, but we're talking about 14 year old and boys that are, and 15 year old boys that are being given commissions as ensigns, which is the lowest rank in the army. Is just in, in my view was just completely absurd. If we think about today, every officer that holds a commission in the English army today now holds a commission. Under the name of King Charles III most of them or virtually all of them will have been commissioned under the will hold commissions from queen elizabeth ii but the queen didn't know any one of most of the, or didn't know probably more than a handful of these officers in reality but what actually happens is that people seem to have ignored is yes people would put forward to raise a regiment and if you're a colonel of a regiment you'd have to pay to raise it generally speaking so the king would know and hand out commissions to senior members of the gentry and they may give the odd other commission in those regiments at that point but a regiment would hold on average 37 commissioned officers if it's a regiment of foot in this period so the king may actually send out commissions for two or three officers out of those 37 what he then does is he sends out blank commissions which have his signature on it to the colonel and the colonel then fills in the rest of those posts and the rest of those posts are given to the colonel's either social network or the social network of other officers or family members that he already knows and in some cases a lot of these commissions go to 
the same family members. There's a regiments that I've seen that have got out of 37 officers, they've got nine or 10 officers that all belong to the same family. And in some cases, you get some bizarre cases. Uh, the Earl of Dumbarton gives a commission to his four year old son into his regiment. So he can start getting seniority and he can start receiving an income. But at four years old, he doesn't do anything. And although this process was supposedly outlawed, it still happened. So this sort of quashes this idea that every officer that was commissioned in the army was commissioned by James and allowing him to sort of change the course of the English army and make it into a Catholic army. Now, going back to sort of some of these ideas, and one of these ideas about having a Catholic army was supposedly this fourth troop of horse guards, which was 200 men. It was the most senior regiment in the army. And today it's still in existence in theory, in our in sort of has been absorbed into the Blues and Royals because it was that sort of regiment. Uh, its colonel was Lord Dover, who was uh, one of Ca uh, James II's Catholic uh, friends and sort of senior nobility within the country. And it was always assumed that for that reason, and because James did it, that the whole regiment was going to be Catholic. Whereas in actual fact, the second in command was a gentleman called Lord uh, Sunderland. Not only was he a devout Protestant, it turns out he was also the president of what was known to be the Treason Club. And the Treason Club was a group of officers and nobility that met during 1685 and 1686. Uh, to discuss overthrowing James II's reign and work closely with uh, William, then William of Orange, uh, to make sure that the army didn't uh, sort of fulfill its role of effectively and to get it to try and turn and sort of uh, defect over to William on the event of uh, the landing. And as a brief side note, historians haven't called this the Treason Club. They called it the Treason Club. It's on the, on the letters that they've sent between each other. And it's just something that I do find is rather bizarre, is the fact that if you're going to issue a secret club for the overthrow of your king, you'd think that hopefully you'd have a slightly more like sort of nuanced and sort of code name rather than just calling it the treason club. So as I was going through looking through sort of the uh, commission rec records, again it adds this whole idea that while yes James certainly did employ Catholics and the number of Catholics in the army did increase under James II, in reality, it only increased in the same order that the size of the army increased. So the next slide is showing a picture of a training camp on Hounslow Heath, which James uh, had every summer between 1685 and 1688. And it was a, effectively a training camp for three months where the majority of the army could actually come together and get involved in doing large scale training, which is something that hadn't been done before. Now, during these camps, so they lasted for sort of three months or so, depending on the weather, uh, certainly in 1686 and 1687, uh, temporary Catholic chapels were built on the heath to allow for Catholics within the army, both officers and enlisted men, to take their weekly church service. And we know the fact the sacraments were administered by a chaplain, uh, Nicholas Trapp, who held the position of chaplain in Sir Edward Hale's regiment of foot, which 
at its maximum had 16 out of its 37 officers as being Catholic. Um, so Edward Hales is an officer that James used in a, to some extent, engineered court case to allow effectively it to become legal that James could dispense Catholics from taking the test, which is a famous case called Goddard versus Hales, where his, Hales' servant was effectively paid to take his master to court by the fact that he hadn't taken the test because he was a Catholic. And the courts ruled that the king had the right to overrule parliament because the laws were effectively issued in the name of the king. Now, although we end up here with having sort of certainly regiments such as Lord Hale's regiment having large numbers of Catholic officers, one of the other charges that was levied against James II was the fact that he pushed Catholic officers over Protestant officers, which was one of the stories that was meant to fill fear amongst Protestant officers to get them to effectively go against the king. And it's a nice story, but again, the evidence doesn't seem to actually support this. We know, for instance, that the Duke of Newcastle uh, raised a regiment of infantry, and due to a technical error, he got the number of officers that he needed uh, incorrectly, and he actually commissioned more officers than he should have done. And two of the captains uh, that uh, ended up losing their commissions were one of his sort of distant relatives, uh, Henry Ogle, and there was also uh, another officer, uh, Ensign John Brown, who both lost their commissions. They were both Catholic, and these are two officers where we know that definitely were Catholic, uh, and they lost their commissions rather than Protestant officers. So we know there wasn't a deliberate attempt, if you like, to catalyze the, the, the army in this way. One of the other things that we do see is uh, when the events of 1688 were unfolding before the invasion or before William's landing, depending which way you'd like to put it, James knew that this was happening and he recalled uh, six brigades of, or six regiments that were on service with the Dutch army called the Anglo-Dutch and the Scotch-Dutch Brigade. William allowed any officers to come back to England that wanted to do so. Uh, and out of some 40, 45 officers that come back, uh, only six of those officers are Catholic. Other officers, Catholic officers actually stay with the brigade, which again goes to prove this point that loyalty isn't at this period, despite what people did think at the time or sort of tried to put afterwards that loyalty wasn't purely based on religion, it was based on a number of other reasons. Now, one of the things that James did do, and one of the things that sort of certainly went against him in the court of public uh, opinion, is he transferred over four regiments from the Irish establishment to the English establishment. Now, as I said, there had supposedly been a purge of all Protestants within the Irish army, in the years before, in 1685 and 1686. Uh, now, when these four regiments come over, uh, the fifth one on here, McKinley Gaddy's regiment, is formed over in England, so that's a slightly different situation. Uh, a number of these regiments, certainly Lords Forbes and Colonel Butler's regiment of dragoons, are under strength. And they, are rec they recruit out of Lancashire and Cheshire to fill their numbers. And histories went down and they said, oh, well, Lancashire and Cheshire were both strong Catholic counties, therefore they must have just uh, recruited out of the Catholic population of those two counties. 
But later on, when these regiments uh, end up in December of that year, when they end up sort of uh, being accounted for, there turns out there's 200 plus Protestants within these uh, within these regiments. So they were they were not just Catholic, and they weren't just Irish, as the propaganda actually said. Now. The title of this talk goes back to what happened to these regiments, because on December the 16th and 1688, James issues an order. He knows effectively that there's no way that he can defeat William. He doesn't want it to come down to a civil war. And before he flees to France or attempts to flee to France, he issues an order that the English army should be disbanded. And rather than supposedly as Whig propaganda would state that the Irish troops uh, were ravaging and pillaging and raping the country, we get a large number of troops. And in this case, there's about 900 troops in one position that hold together and their senior officers send effectively a letter to the Lords and to uh, the interim government that's now running the country and effectively says that they effectively desire the Lordship's protection and would propose some means for their security and subsistence in case that you would have them continue here or to give them a speedy license to depart either to their own country or to the service of any prince and the important bit here that may be consistent with the interest of this kingdom. So rather than these soldiers who've been brought over from Ireland to serve in England, the view that they were just, because they were Catholic, they only served James. We have a large number of Catholic soldiers here that are turning around and going, no, we are loyal to the country as a whole, and we, were, we want to serve the best interest of the country. Now, there is no doubt that, yes, there were some, Catholic soldiers, both Irish and from the English army, that decided that they thought that their life uh, would be under threat. Now the fact that England was going to have a Protestant monarch and that James had been overthrown, and there were large numbers of them that did try to leave for Ireland. There's a large number that also, uh, there's some numbers that tried to leave for France to follow James over to France. But we know that a lot of soldiers stayed in the service of William. A lot of soldiers took this option actually just to leave the army all told, because there's one thing being a peaceful army. There was a large fear in actual fact that they would be that William wanted the English army because he wanted the English army to fight on Europe. And there's a difference to being a soldier in the English army defending England to being actually forced to fight on a continental basis. Now, as far as William was concerned, when he got the army that he could find to actually sort of come back together after they were disbanded, William wasn't interested in religion. He was interested purely in people being loyal to him. And the standard way that the army showed its loyalty is they called the army together, a regiment together. They would lay down their arms on the floor. Officers would lay down their sword. They would then be asked to pick their swords and their muskets back up in the name of the king. And that was enough for William to show that their loyalty was to William. So there were large numbers of Catholics that stayed in the army because soldiering was the only thing that they knew. And there was never really a problem about this, although history later on has since to try, try to sort of hide it. Now, the Irish troops were something slightly different because William had a couple of problems. One was the parliament didn't like the fact that William only wanted people to swear loyalty to him. Parliament wanted them to actually to reinstigate the test acts and actually during the first two years of his reign Parliament kept on trying to increase 
the wording of the test acts to make it harder for anybody. They put wording in that you denied that James II had any right to the throne, uh, and they added extra bits in in case somebody had got dispensation from their priest to take the test act and then go to the priest and seek forgiveness because they've denied transubstantiation. So James decides that A, first of all, he's going to pay these troops so that they can actually live and they can stay together. And he's gonna pay them six pence a day for their support, which is two pence less than they would have been paid normally. And he's gonna give the officers half their pay, but they're not being told to do anything. This is just effectively until he can sort them out. He also arranges for them to have tents and bedding. And because he's not sure about how the country is going to deal with these troops, what he does is he sends them to the Isle of Wight. Now, this is done for a couple of reasons. The main reason is say so almost to protect the troops from the population rather than to, to protect the population from the Irish troops. And as they get down to Portsmouth and Southampton on their way to the Isle of Wight, here's where we find that out of these supposedly all Catholic regiments, there's a good couple of hundred Protestants within those regiments that get taken out and other Catholic troops from other English regiments take their place and we end up with about 2,000 Catholic soldiers on the Isle of Wight. Now they weren't here as prisoners, it was just a camp and the areas on here, Yarmouth, Cowles, Ryde and Goss Hill have all got some uh, evidence of the Catholic soldiers within the island. Uh, there's a large number of these Catholic soldiers here that uh, marry the local inhabitants. Uh, there's a Captain McInnes of Colonel Butler's Regiment of Dragoons who applies effectively the fact that for leave, he wants to leave the army because he's married to a lady who's living in London and he's given a pass to leave the island and he ends up going to London. And unfortunately, this is where we lose him from historical records. But it certainly shows that these troops weren't being held as captive at all. Now, originally, according to, uh, if you like, legend, they were all held in Casper Castle, which had been used as a prison previously, including holding Charles I and a number of other key royalists uh, during the Civil War. It's a nice story. It could have never have fitted that number of people in, but in reality, the troops are housed in a camp about a mile and a half away from Carisbrook Castle. They're housed under canvas, uh, camp beds are provided for them, and so they mingle in with the local population. Uh, and they stay there until a deal is made uh, between William and Emperor Leopold uh, the I of Austria, where the regiment is effectively sold into service with the Habsburg Empire. William does this for a couple of reasons. One, because he's got a tight, he's got he already got an agreement with Leopold to provide troops for fighting against Louis XIV to France. He's also not completely sure about having an Irish regiment or Irish regiments fighting as a whole in Flanders against uh, Louis XIV in case they actually come up against uh, James II. So he sends them over to the Habsburg Empire under the caveat that they're meant to serve on the Habsburg's sort of eastern or southern flank against the Ottoman Empire. And this was something that was reasonably common in this period is selling regiments to other countries for their service. Uh, William in his invasion force uh, and certainly in his invasion force of Ireland brings over 6,000 Danish troops that are sold under the same sort of agreement from Denmark. And 
this is one of the bits where we do start to find out about some of the individuals because while they're over on the Isle of Wight, they get hit with uh, an outbreak of smallpox. And this is St Mary's Church in Cowles, where there are the burials. And as close as I could find from any of the records and from the verger, uh, the graves here are two graves of a Captain John Ware and a Captain Gallios, that were two Irish officers that were buried in the churchyard following dying from, small, from smallpox while they were there. And their graves were paid for out of church funds which is the only reason that in actual fact that we managed that I managed to track them because of the records in the church, the church records for how their funds were used. And we tracked these troops originally into the six regiments in the Habsburg Empire. By the way, you have to love somebody, an emperor that was that's willing to have his portraits taken in such sort of a drab clothing as Emperor Leopold, although this was actually for a fancy dress uh, party that, that he held. And when we're looking at Catholics within the army itself of William, uh, this gentleman here is Sir Henry Bellacy. Uh, he raises a regiment for William in 1689. Now he's an interesting story because William appoints him military governor of Galway in 1691 because, according to William, Sir Henry was a Catholic and therefore the residents of Galway would be happier to have a governor who was Catholic and would sort of, so that they would sort of feel that he was on their side uh, more than having a Protestant governor. The interesting bit about Sir Henry Bellacy is I can find no records whatsoever that the gentleman was Catholic at all, or that he had any Catholics within his family. But according to William, he thought he was. And therefore, despite the fact that sort of, uh, I can't find any proof, William was convinced that he was a Catholic. William therefore knew that there was a colonel that had raised a regiment for him that was a Catholic. Uh, and was quite happy with this fact. And then just to finish off, uh, when the English army is in Ireland, there is a camp in Dundalk in 1689, where there is a plot that is found out where there are four Catholics, at least two of them were Jesuit priests that had sort of slipped into the camp and were trying to persuade troops to desert over to James's army that was about 15 miles away from where this camp was. Now, as part of William's army, there were four regiments of Huguenot troops. Now, these troops were Huguenots that had come over to England roughly in 1685 around that point after Louis XIV had revoked the Edict of Nantes, which, al which allowed non-Catholics to sort of live and work and worship in France without sort of uh, any fear. And when he revoked this, you couldn't be sort of not a Catholic in France, and you certainly couldn't educate your children, you couldn't be employed, and large numbers fled the country. And these regiments were always assumed to be ultra-Protestant. They were nicknamed as the, the Lions of Judah, and they were meant to be sort of this ultra Protestant anti Catholic force because they'd seen all the horrors in France following the purges then. Well, after this plot by this fifth columnist is found out, William orders effectively he wants to make sure that, the, that there are no if you like, other fifth columns. And the way that he does this, he calls every regiment, gets every regiment to be called up, and he gets every regiment effectively to declare if they're Protestant. Now, 390, sorry, 353 Catholic troops come forward from these four regiments, and there are a number of other Catholic troops that come forward from English regiments. And rather than being treated as traitors, or being treated as fifth columnists, what happens is, is William goes, 
Thank you very much. Would you like to serve me or would you like to effectively end your military uh, commitment? They all agree to carry on serving because, as I said earlier in the presentation, so if quite often soldiering was a, the only profession that a lot of these men had. And what he does is he transfers these troops from the island, from the army in Ireland, because he's willing to have their service, but he doesn't want to give them the opportunity or any possibility that they may either defect or other troops won't respect the regiments enough and they end up serving in regiments in Flanders in the Dutch army and again this is not something that is used as a punishment as such because when we look at when William takes control of the English army regiments that were old regiments that had served James for three years were sent to Flanders to fight in William's war against Louis XIV because they weren't sent to Ireland generally because he didn't quite trust them. But he still knew that they were they were soldiers that were willing to fight loyally for the country. So going back to my initial slide, as I look through this, the one thing that I found and Partly expected at the start, I guess, is the fact that we all know today that loyalty is multifaceted. You can be loyal to your football team as well as loyal to sort of the family and you can be loyal to the country. Religion is important in this period of time, but it's not the only thing that was important to people. That people could be loyal to both their religion and also loyal to their king. And that the evidence shows that James II certainly had no intent of converting the whole English army into Catholic. There's a thing that by the end of his uh, reign, when he knows that, the, that William and Mary are planning an invasion, the English army reaches a peak of about 38,000 men, and there weren't enough Catholics in the country to fill all those positions, even if he'd wanted to without stripping the whole of, sort of the Catholic male population. It was something that was never, ever going to happen. Also, the fact that he wasn't responsible for actually uh, commissioning all these officers in the first place. And then as far as William goes, William has always been more interested in loyalty to him and to his wife and to, and to his crown, rather than to a religion. Uh, the two things that I find quite interesting, and when I've taught the Glorious Revolution at university, the two facts that I always like to uh, get my students to think about is the first one is William, was unable to take the test just the same that James was because William was a Calvinist and therefore by default never went to a Church of England service every week so was not allowed in theory not allowed to take the test although the king was never subject to the test the second point is is that William of Orange before he arranged to come over because one of his main if you like, allies in Europe was Le Emperor Leopold of the Habsburg Empire, which had a very large Catholic population and was by default a Catholic sort of uh, emperor, uh, received a papal bull allowing him to invade England in 1688 under the provision that he was doing it uh, to ensure the succession of his wife rather than for the subjugation of the Catholic population in England. Uh, and William continued to have Catholics within his army. Uh, the other fact is that when William lands in Torbay in 1688, he probably has twice as many Catholics in his army as there were in the English army that he was supposedly coming to defeat, to defend the, the Protestant religion. 
So I hope you found it interesting. Uh, and I think we've got, hopefully it has, I think I'm roughly on time, it's about 55 minutes. So hopefully we've got some time for uh, questions if there are any questions. So thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mark. Uh, interesting and uh, illuminating uh, talk on um, the armies at that time and um, some things that I didn't know about them. And uh, uh, could you just explain about the, the, the Test Act of 1673, uh, what it involved? So, yeah, so the main part of the Test Act, we say, was three phase. The first one is that you had to regularly attend uh, church and that was the church of england church uh and in reality you would get a slip of paper from your from the vicar saying that you had attended each week uh the second part is the fact that you would have to deny transubstantiation uh so if you took any position of authority you'd have to effectively swear that you denied transubstantiation you'd have to be able to prove that you attended church on a regular basis. And the third bit was sort of, uh, you had to take the oath of supremacy, which states that the king was the highest power on earth, which if you were Catholic, obviously that would become the Pope. And you had to take that within three months of you taking up your position. Now, most of the dispensations that I've seen and you generally find from almost a couple of weeks after James inherits the throne. That he's issuing dispensations to the test, but most of the dispensations that he's issuing aren't for people in the army and they're not even for nobility, they're for just normal people, they're shopkeepers, they're farmers, they're merchants that have been effectively been accused of failing to go to church on a regular basis and therefore are subject to a fine by the church which effectively goes up to the bishop and then can go up to the king. So he's dispensing people and most of these people are say non-conformists uh, James actually issues in, I think it's in 1687, uh, legislation that Quakers are exempt from taking the provisions of the test uh, as, a, as a whole group, whereas, it, and that's, I think, the only group that he does it to. But this whole idea is effectively was designed to try and keep Catholics out of positions of power within England uh, because of there is this idea that if you were Catholic, you were there by default, we were both not loyal to England because you'd got a higher power that you were loyal to, but also a fear that you were loyal automatically to Louis XIV of France. So, so we look at, sorry. Sorry, that we look at now is quite, is quite a strange and quite a step. But at the time, there was a real fear that sort of that you were by default had to be loyal to another country and not loyal to the crown so a lot of it was to do with loyalty the corporation act i think was 1661 wasn't it i think and that was another way of excluding catholics as well uh, from offices uh, i think was the test and corporation act um repealed uh, 1828 or thereabouts i think as far as I can remember, yes, I can't remember the exact date, but I know it. I know it's in the 1820s. Yes, I think it was about 1828 and then the Emancipation Act 29, 1829, I think. But of course, it was all down to loyalty because the 18, the, the um, uh, in, in the previous century, there was a, a question of loyalty in 1790, of course, 1790, 1791, there was sort of change in the law uh, about oaths of loyalty to the uh, to the monarch. Uh, because there was a lot of um, pressure from Catholic recusants, um, and I mentioned this in one of the talks I did before, uh, to, to change that and basically say, well, we're loyal to the king, we're just a different faith, that's all, well, we're still yes. the loyal. And so, and so gradually over time, um, the fear of disloyalty 
uh, and, and possibly treason, was um, diminished um, as the Catholics became more and more influential, really, and gradually persuaded Parliament, the King, etc., the Privy Council, the establishment. They were no longer a threat, and were they were actually loyal. In fact, and the fact they they just worshipped in a different church didn't actually mean that they were disloyal to the state uh, or treasonous or whatever. Which had, from previous times, because we we go back to the time sixteen oh five and the gunpowder plot, so called, uh, you know, treason and loyalty was was key, wasn't it? Absolutely key to stability in the state. So things change over time, really. We've got a question um, here from. Um, let's see if I can find it. Uh, the question here yeah okay so uh from timothy Pembroke here what would what it says what about the oath of loyalty to a king by the officers i think i don't know whether we've covered that already but it's you know obviously he, he wants to know about that so generally the oath of, as far as james and william were concerned they were both effectively just concerned with an officer literally just swearing an oath of loyalty to James and then yeah. to William, to William and Mary, because obviously William and Mary were crowned joint monarchs. And it was yes. following uh, the events of 1688 in 16, effectively in December 1688, they're offered the crown as a joint monarch. Uh, and both monarchs were concerned purely effectively just about loyalty to them so they literally just swore a loyalty to be loyal to james ii and with his four titles or william and queen mary it was parliament and the lords that insisted on the test acts being put through and they took an act of part and uh, sorry a court case of goddard versus hales to prove legally that james could dispense offers officers from taking the test which he did uh william uh, first of all just allows all officers as i said they just swear loyalty to him uh there's some officers that he still does that doesn't trust particularly much even though they do swear off loyalty to him one of them is churchill who later becomes obviously the likes of uh, the duke of marlborough who, although William uses his services, he doesn't particularly trust him because the fact that he was loyal to James for so long. Uh, but as time goes past, they, the first oath to William and Mary is literally just, I swear loyalty and fealty to him. It then becomes that swears loyalty to him and denies the fact that, well, first of all, confirms the fact that James II has abdicated and that he no longer has any lawful power and they don't support either James or any of his sons to the right to the succession. And then they add on extra bits on top of that afterwards about the fact that how uh, the, the Pope actually in one of the oaths that is put forward and is never actually accepted is there's wording effectively that states that they have to swear that the Pope in actual fact is the devil incarnate because there's this real anti-Catholic sort of fervor that's going on amongst certain members of uh, the Lords and uh, the House of Commoners or the House of Commons as we now we now know it. Hmm. Okay. So hopefully that answers that question, I think. Yeah, of course, today, uh, even today in the armed forces, uh, you have to uh, swear an oath of loyalty i've had to do so the bible and um you know uh, to the, the the queen and heirs as successors and all that stuff so there's still there's still an oath of loyalty but obviously religion doesn't come into it of course uh, anymore um uh this question here says what are, what are, what are the english uh, news so new news books at the time saying about louis the 14th and his army at the time of james the second is supposedly filling the army with catholics yeah, the the reason why I asked that question was because I'm wondering if there's any sort of um, in the English imagination when they're reading these news books, is there any sort of complete sort of merging of what's going on in England compared to what's going on in France? And in the English Puritan mind, of course, they're going to connect the two, even though the reality is completely different. But just wondering. 
what the English news books at the time were saying about Louis XIV and what he was doing with his army. And that may have perhaps fed into what they thought about James II. It's a really good question. And yes, there is a lot of this bit where they transfer the one to the other. So one of the things that they see is they, by default, they follow this chain that James II is Catholic. Therefore, he has to be an absolute monarch. And therefore, by default, he has to be doing exactly the same that Louis XIV was doing. So when we look at the revocation of the Edict of Nantes in 1685, and the army is used to effectively purge Huguenots and Protestants in France. If you are sort of non-Catholic, you can't educate your children, you can't work, you can't leave, the, but also you can't leave the country, which is the interesting bit. Mm -hmm. That you're saying that you're not allowed to live in the country under your current religion but you can't leave the country either and so you start getting lots of Huguenot refugees coming over to England and to other Protestant countries and also some Catholic countries as well such as the Habsburg Empire and they bring forward these stories of sort of the abuse of the French army uh, and also at this time, we're also looking, obviously, the French army is at war, the France is at war with a number of its Protestant neighbours. So you add all this together and suddenly you now get this great fear of effectively of having a absolute king, as in James II, because he's Catholic, therefore he has to, by default, be absolute. He has to be subservient to Louis XIV. Uh, and therefore he's subservient to the Pope, despite the fact that the Pope and Louis XIV don't actually get on in this period because the Pope is concerned about the expansion of France, which is why the Pope yeah. issues William uh, of Orange an edict, allowing him to effectively take the crown mm -hmm. of England. Uh, we also start getting these, uh, these stories of, certainly in 1688, of and even before that you get some stories of massacres of protestant families by hidden catholics within the community and you'll get all these stories coming through and they get through into the papers and then in 1688 you get what's now commonly known as the irish fright coming through which is supposedly hordes of catholics going through and depending on which version that you see they rape and pillage uh reading they burn oxford down to the ground that most of reading is burnt down to the ground and you've got ten thousand catholics raging through the country that are heading to london that are going to burn everything down to the ground uh so much so that you have to get actually lots of people coming from reading and from london coming down into the capital going well I've just left Reading I've just left London it was peaceful it was quiet <laughs> yeah while at the same time having mobs in London and there's mobs in London that burn down two Catholic chapels one that belongs mm -hmm. to the Spanish embassy yeah because they've heard of this supposedly this mob of Catholics that are coming down to sort of destroy the country. But this is a period where you've got where the Great Fire of London was put down to Catholics, mm -hmm. was caused by Catholics. Yeah. Uh, so you have this fear, and obviously, if you like, sort of, uh, the 5th of November doesn't help the fact that it was a Catholic plot to blow up Parliament, yeah. but every, every everything else that that's bad that's befalls the kingdom is put down to Catholics either at the time or it's yeah. put back onto it in previous events in history. I've seen reports where effectively the Black Death was brought over by Catholics. Yeah. That people I mean, are reporting in the 1680s that the Black Death is caused by Catholics rather than but because it's anything that they can use to put down the Catholic. Catholic I mean, population. Yeah, Sorry. I mean, 
obviously the, the sort of Irish element will play into the memory of the 1641 Irish Rebellion, which of course is still very fresh into the minds of people in, in England at the time. So you just wonder how much of it was orchestrated from behind the scenes by Wilma of Orange's sort of propagandists. Um, there is certainly some extent. that, yeah, there's certainly some that is. Uh, most of what I've seen is just more about as far as dealing with making sure that most of the, as far as you can, most of the army or the senior officers in the army mm -hmm. are going to make sure that their regiments don't fight him. And as such that the English Navy ends up deploying towards Hull yeah. and stays out of the way of yeah. the invasion fleet. Yeah. So there's no naval battle, but the English yeah. Navy quite happily just seems to be out of the way yeah. rather than him directly being responsible, if you like, for the religious side of the propaganda. Yeah. But that's certainly yeah. being brought up all the way through. And so he's claimed to be the same. He doesn't, yeah, he adds to it and he certainly works on it yeah. by claiming that he's coming to save England and save yeah. the Protestant nation. Yeah. Which you say is quite funny for somebody that brings over 4,000 armed Catholic troops with him Absolutely. that he tends to ignore slightly. It's like. I think it's one of those things in history is like uh, stories get told or get garbled uh, over time or or with deliberate propaganda, et cetera, et cetera. You mentioned about 1605 and the so-called gunpowder plot. And I've published an article on that. And I think there's a lot of evidence that, uh, you know, some of, some of it was made up, <clears throat> some of it probably just, just doesn't uh, uh, doesn't stack up at all, the government portion of the story. And of course, there've been many such riots and problems. I mean, the Gordon riots at the later date were, you know, stirred up by people with a an axe to grind and so on. So there's been an awful lot of examples of this throughout history. If you don't mind just moving on this, um, if that's okay, um, uh, John and Lindsay to say, at least an accurate, uh, last an accurate account of this topic. When I used to teach this in a Catholic school, I was met with skepticism by other teachers, excellent research. So uh, clear praise for you, Mark, there. And Thank so, you very much. Uh, uh, Kirstein says, thanks for a fascinating talk, Mark. Uh, is Henry, Belaise, that's B-E-L-A-Y-S-E, related to Thomas Belaise, I don't know whether I pronounced that correctly, who was married to Mary Cromwell. Belaise was supposed to be Catholic. There is uh, a rumor that Sir Thomas, his father was a Catholic. William, of course, was a big fan of Oliver Cromwell. As far as I can remember, yes. I think he, I think he is, yes. Hmm. So, but, I, yeah, no, it was just. I'm, I'm pulling it from the back of my mind, and I possibly, but he was one of those figures that was on the outskirts of my research, yeah. rather than yeah. rather yeah. than central. And certainly on his tomb in Westminster, there's nothing that would indicate. Yeah. That that he was Catholic, and when you read his his certainly his new bio biographies. <laughs> They don't mention the fact that he was that he was Catholic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We know, I, we know that a lot of people who hid their faith uh, didn't admit to it. So we don't really know for certain with the yeah. number of. No, I was people. I was just interested because I also know that Thomas Belize was involved in Charles II's government as well. Um, he was a top um, government figure under Charles II. Um, so I wondered if that's where Henry. Henry's promotion came from in, the, in that sense that there's a sort of line. Um, but the thing that always amuses me about Thomas Valesi is he used to take his wife to, to court with him. And apparently it used to, um, Charles II used to take fright because Mary was just the double of her father. <laughs> so <laughs> she used to turn up at court and King Charles is like, oh my God, you know, I'm looking at Oliver Cromwell because she was just his double, you know. But yeah, I just wondered if he was part of the same family, that's all. Right. I like the idea of a four-year-old officer. I thought that was a, a, a great idea there. <laughs> it, it was, and it, it happened a bit, not that often, because no. officers were, although you had to buy your promotion, and generally sort of 
in a normal regiment to buy an ensigns would cost you about 50 pounds when you bought a lieutenant it would go up it would double every time you increased in rank but seniority was also important so obviously if you give your if you get your son a commission at four when he actually becomes an ensign probably about 14 he's got 10 years seniority over anybody else yeah and whatever rank he buys he'll always be the most senior officer in that rank yes so it just gives him that extra little leg up one of the things about i guess about that i was just thinking going back to the question if you like about this propaganda and in the papers one of the big things that we obviously also get is with in this period with we are for we are dealing with the fallout of the allegations made by uh oats who comes up with i, I think 62 or 63 different catholic plots mm. the cause of deaths of at least 14 people as far as i know that are executed for plots against the crown and against sort of uh, the state and then it turns out that effectively that there was all a complete uh, pack of sort of i'll be kind and say it was imaginative imaginative ideas and plots if not outright lies in cases so you've got this untold you've got this underlying fear all the way through and you've got obviously the right house plot which was a real plot against the king so you have got episodes that feed into the public imagination about having a catholic sort of army available but as i said sort of none of the evidence goes to prove that we were anywhere near getting anything close to a catholic regiment or army even the most catholic regiments had more protestant officers in them than they did have catholic officers yeah that's very interesting, actually. I find it interesting that there was a treason cl club, you know, at, at the same time there was a treason act in, in place. Uh, and to have a treason club just sounds rather strange and rather um, rather a weird idea, actually, that they that they paraded it. <laughs> it just seems particularly ridiculous. It but, does, uh, doesn't it? It's a bit that gets me, and it's like, so if, so if, yeah, if you're going to do it, you'd call it something else. Yes, like a exactly. drinking there's, club or something. There's, there's, another, something. There's, there's the famous Kit Kat Club, which was used yeah. by people that effectively had similar aims in a lot of mm. ways. But yes. they don't openly announce the fact that they're there to to like to get rid of the king. Whereas the the mm. army officers obviously were like, well, this is what we're doing. We're committing treason by doing this. So yes, this is what we're going to call it. So, but I'm not quite sure whether that just says something about the lack of imagination of army officers in the 16 in the late 1680s. Yes, quite possibly, uh, or or the sort of blatant attitude that they had of you know sticking two fingers up, really, at the system, um, one or the other. Anyway, um, excellent. Well, if there's no more questions, I think we'll sort of um, we'll, we'll call a halt to it and. Um, Thank you very much, Mark, for a fascinating and interesting uh, talk. I've learnt a few things uh, this evening I didn't know about, about that period. Um, it was really interesting. Thanks ever so much.